Good morning. <laughs> Guess what I'm talking about this morning? <laughs> Mother's Day. Mother's Day was first introduced into the United States by a woman whose name was Julia Ward Howe in 1872. That interesting. She uh, said it was a day to be dedicated to peace. And she then organized meetings once a year on Mother's Day in Boston, Massachusetts and surrounding areas. The idea took root and it did begin to be celebrated on an annual basis, starting in Boston. So I'm going to share with you today a very deep-rooted history about the principles of motherhood. It is based on the teachings, the teachings of truth. I'll be sharing different legends about the image of the mother as seen throughout the history of humanity from the teachings of Joseph Campbell, Helena Rourke, Hallelujah Rumi, the Master M, and Torquem Serdarian. From the book Illumination, it says, I have already told you that the mother of the world conceals her name. I have already shown you how the mother of the world hides her face. I have already made mention of the mother of the Buddha and Christ. <laughs> Certainly, it is now time to tell people that the mother of both lords is not a symbol, but a great manifestation of the feminine origin. The spiritual mother of Christ and the Buddha. It was she who taught them and ordained them for Padvig. From time immemorial, the mother of the world has sent forth her children to Padvig. Throughout the history of humanity, her hand traces an unbreakable thread. On Sinai, her voice rang forth she assumed the image of Kali. She was at the foundation of Isis and Ishtar. After Atlantis, when a blow was inflicted upon the cult of the spirit, she began to spin a new thread, which is now beginning to shine forth. After Atlantis, the mother of the world veiled her face and forbade anyone to utter her name until the hour of the constellation struck. She has only manifested herself partially and never manifested herself on a planetary scale. A legend says that about 5,000 years ago, the world mother gathered around her all advanced women in the world. These women were at least third degree initiates, which means they had achieved total purity and transformation in their lives. The world mother collected these women around her and created a many petaled flower in which the woman formed the petals and she stood at the core a beautiful lotus of many petals now stands in space from which the petals, age after age, incarnate and later give birth to all heroes, world leaders, and great ones. This verse frames for us the beauty and creativity of the principle of the world mother and of Mothers of Humanity. Torquem Serdarian wrote, this organized group in its totality is called the World Mother. But at the same time, each of the petals is called the World Mother because each petal represents the totality 
of the world mother. This is a phenomenon similar to what we find in a flower. Each petal takes energy, inspiration, impression, and life current from the core of the flower, but each petal also represents the flower. Now about the mother of the world, Helena Rourke wrote her students saying, in the epoch of the mother of the world, we must welcome every mention of her. In the East, the worshipers of the mother of the world is widespread and one might say it is predominant in Hinduism. But even among other factions, one finds more worshipers of the Great Mother than any other aspect of divinity. In Mongolia and Tibet, the White Tara and other Taras are greatly worshiped. In the most ancient religions, the feminine deities were considered the most sacred. In 1924, the rays of the luminary of the mother of the world reached planet Earth, and in pouring upon it, they awakened a new consciousness. The hearts of many women were kindled with aspiration toward new life. According to the sacred teaching, the fall of humanity began from the time of feminine principle. Therefore, with the beginning of the epoch of the mother of the world, woman should realize that she herself contains all forces. And the moment she shakes off the age-old hypnosis of her seemingly lawful subjugation and mental inferiority, and occupies herself with a manifold education. She will create, in collaboration with man, a new and better world, the new world. The manifestation of the mother of the world will create unity. The task now is to create a spiritually sovereign position for the woman and the transmission to woman of direct communion with the highest forces is necessary as a psychological impetus. Of course, through the new religion will come the necessary respect. The new religion will give many beautiful examples of women who have achieved much for humanity with their beauty and simplicity. It will be shown that the mother of Christ and the mother of Buddha were the same. Now, Joseph Campbell, in his book, Mythic Magic, says, in one of the earliest moments of Buddhist art, is the dream of the Buddha's mother, Queen Maya, the night she conceived the Savior. She thought she saw descending through her sleep from the heaven of the highest gods, where the reincarnating monad of the one now to become the Buddha had been dwelling between incarnations, <laughs> the form of a glorious white elephant radiant with four brilliant tusks, which on reaching the earth walked thrice around her bed in the auspicious sunwise direction, struck her right side with its trunk and entered the womb. According to the earliest known version of the Buddhist nativity legend, the young Queen Maya, having carried the world savior in her womb for exactly 10 lunar months and desiring to give birth to her child in her mother's home, was being transported in a golden palaquin by her company of attendants 
along a road beautified for the journey with banners and streamers and glowing trees set out in pots. When they came to a glorious pleasure garden of trees that was at that moment in bloom, there were among its fragrant boughs humming swarms of bees of five colors, flocks of birds of various feathers, and the young queen, wishing to pause in that delightful spot, descended from her palaquin and entered the pleasure grove, surrounded by her company. Whereupon, at the foot of a green giant tree, the pains of her time took her over, and when she reached upward with her right hand, a flowery bough of that tree bent down, like the tip of a well-steamed reed, and grasping it, the young queen standing gave birth to her child, who came forth from her right side. Four pure-minded Mahabrahma great ones who had instantly descended received the infant on a golden net and placed him before his mother, giving praise. Rejoice, O queen, they said. There has been born to you a mighty son. From the sky, two pure streams of water fell refreshing the child and its mother, after which the infant, standing upright, facing east, strode forward seven steps, pointed upward with his right hand, downward with his left, and shouted with a noble voice the victory shout of all the Buddhas. Worlds above, worlds below, the chief in all the worlds am I. Why the name Queen Maya? The cosmic feminine principle is called Maya. Maya is a veiling power that hides or conceals the real, the inward, essential character of things, so that as we read in a sacred Sanskrit text, though it is hidden in all things, the, sh the self shines forth. And what about Mary? Mary lived in the temple of Jerusalem up until her 14th year. She lived the purest life possible for a child, physically, emotionally, and mentally. Her physical environment was beautiful, with trees and flowers, architectural masterpieces were surrounding her. Mary was so pure that she was able to be in continuous communication with the angelic kingdom. She passed through disciplines of fasting, of emotional and mental control. In long years of silence, loneliness, and prayer, Mary told Joseph when in great surprise she saw she was with child, I was at the fountain to fill my pitcher when a glorious angel stood at my side and said, Mary, peace be with you. Behold, a light from heaven will come and dwell in you. The power of the highest will overshadow you, and you, a virgin, will conceive and bear a son. On the way to Bethlehem, Mary's time for deliverance of her child was at hand, and they hastened to find a place to rest. At a shepherd's home, Joseph explained the situation, 
and the shepherd led them to a cave-like room where some sheep were housed. Mary gave birth to her child. The baby stretched out his little hand, and on the palm was a red sign, a star. Upon this sign, we, the Magi, placed the most precious pearl of those we brought. In a story given by the Master Moya, he tells us it was the command of the Brotherhood to hail Jesus, to safeguard and bring some means to the poor family, to help them spiritually and financially. Let us now take a look at today's woman. Look at the role women must participate in to help perpetuate the principle of the mother. One, women will bring about a true spirit of brotherhood in humanity. Two, women will be the transmitters of the spiritual light of the hierarchy to humanity. Three, they will bring illumination and guidance from their innermost cores and he lead humanity with love, compassion, and intuition. Women's, this is number four, women's mission will be to be the spiritual leaders of humanity. This is a very important statement, very esoteric. It, it almost goes against the flow of many Christian traits and dogma, which is just the opposite of that. The opposite of that says the spiritual authority in the family is the man. The teachings of truth say women's mission will be to be the spiritual leaders of humanity. That was number four. Number five, women will treat the world as her child. And through her children, women will point humanity in the right direction. Six, she will inspire the children of the world by bestowing vision and inspiration. Seven, it is women who will teach about heroes, nobility, and virtues. Eight, it is women who will teach about the sanctity of life and the glory of spiritual manifestations. And number nine, in spiritual and creative endeavors, women will prepare the way for the greatness of humanity to flourish. And number 10, we are told women will inspire beauty and culture in the human race and help great achievements to be realized. Now, if you take these 10 points and place them alongside of what is happening today about the rights of women, nothing in here said politicians had the right to decide for women. This is how, how engrossed in matter people's minds have become. They, they've lost sight of the beauty of life, of the power and the dignity of the spirit of women are. But the teaching tells us now things are shifting and I think the war that's going on now with the Supreme Court 
and their decision making. You know, we can we can pray that the women on the Supreme Court will respond to that core of their being, to their spiritual life and the spirit of women and make sure that that draft does not go any further. So it's a real critical point and this critical point is like the midway between heaven and earth, the midway point between heaven and earth. So we will see how smart, particularly the women of the Supreme Court are. Now I vowed when I was driving over here this morning that I was not going to involve my personal, <laughs> but it's real hard not to do when, when we are so anchored in the power and beauty of the teachings and the mother of the world, when we have this magnificent painting by Nicholas Rourke in front of us of the mother of the world, and to reduce her to decisions that are based in politics is outrageously wrong. It's almost criminal. In fact, I would say it's criminal. Um, let me move on. <laughs> there is a little known tradition in the spiritual affairs of the world that concerns the way some of the greatest teachings have been given to humanity. These are teachings that have been given by women. Women who have carefully and deliberately kept their identity sacred or at least their personalities hidden as much as possible as they presented their ideas. Helena Rourke was one of those women. Helena chose to remain in this tradition as much as possible while she presented her philosophy, her spiritual philosophy to the world. She preferred, like many others before her, to let the teaching speak for itself. While she kept her personality in the background, yet inspired by Master Moya, who is also Helena Blavatsky's master, Helena Rourke brought us the teachings of Agni Yoga, the highest known form of yoga today. She wrote of women, let us develop primarily a sense of our own dignity and learn to lean courageously on our own strength and knowledge in order to join in as well as accept responsibility for the great structure of the greater good. The lofty mission of women must be performed by the woman, and the temple of the mother of the world should abide, in this temple should abide the woman. In Fiery World 3, paragraph 34, 30, 30, 347, sorry, indeed, it says, indeed, councils of ministers will have to include women. Woman who gives life to people must also have a voice in the making of its destiny. Woman must have the right voice. If woman were accepted as was ordained, the world would be quite differently impregnated. The age of woman refers to leadership by the feminine principle, the principle of love and compassion and intuition. In the ancient wisdom, we are told that the second solar system our present solar system is feminine. The feminine principle is the dominating factor. 
women dominate as agents of greater wisdom. The new religion will bring to women the respect necessary to make the feminine principle influential. Helene Rourke, as history tells us, revealed unusual qualities even in childhood, where she was seen secretly carrying a heavy volume of Dory's Bible. Bending from its burdensome weight, hiding it from the grown-ups, she had taken the treasure in order to study the illustrations. And eventually, when she taught herself to read, to study the Testaments. Helena was born in Russia in February of 1879 and died in 1955. As a child, she was very sensitive and frequently ailing. During illnesses, two very tall men would appear to her with help. But when the grown-ups objected to her sharing her accounts of them, she learned to keep her thoughts <laughs> to herself. A few years ago, I was talking with Daniel Enton, who is then the executive director of the Rourke Museum in New York and the Agni Yoga Society, and I was talking to him about Madame Rourke. He said, and I quote, Helena Rourke was a great, great woman. She was deeply dedicated to the upliftment of the human consciousness. Her balance in life was reflected through her marriage, her two boys, maintaining a household and serving thousands as a spiritual leader. She had a great interest in women and supported the feminist point of view. He went on to say she demonstrated humility by not wanting those who study the teachings to focus on her personal nature, and as such strictly forbade others to portray her picture and details about her personal life, especially in this country. Of course, there are people such as her niece in Russia who through their memories can share those memories about her. He said, Helena Rourke as a great teacher was in contact with thousands of people. She corresponded with hundreds as her students. Some of the correspondence is found in the two volume series, Letters of Helena Rourke. As a mother of two boys, she raised them with the same care she nurtured her students. Her two boys, George, who is no longer living, and Svetislav, who passed fairly recently, reflected the beauty of their mother through their lives and their talents. Svetislav was an artist and gave us a treasure through the portrait which is now hanging in the Nicholas Rourke Museum of his mom in New York City. As visitors would enter the Rourke home, Helena would care for them, making certain their rooms were properly prepared. And when the guests were ready for departure, she would provide food for their journey. Many hours were spent running the house so everyone was taken care of and fed, and the servants helped with the mechanics of daily life. Of her interest in women, one of her concerns was with the founding of organizations for women around the world, though her time did not open the way for this realization. I believe her teachings planted seeds in the minds of women to progress toward the reality of her wisdom and knowledge. While she supported the feminist point of view, not all was of her liking. 
And even now, Daniel felt she would continue to support the feminist point of view. Do you remember back in the day how feminism took on such an ugly overtone? And it's not there anymore. It's the echo is there, but it's matured and blossomed into something much more realistic and balanced. Helena spent many hours in her room writing and typing manuscripts. Nicholas Rourke, her husband, and one of the finest painters of his day, with an unparalleled command of color, was also very spiritually advanced. Nicholas would, from another place of their home, listen to Helena and the clacking of the keys on the typewriter. Because of her many ailments, when the typewriter would become silent, he would quiet himself in concern, waiting to hear the activity come from the typewriter. Once again, knowing then that she was all right and ready to resume her work. One of, in one of Helena Rourke's letters to Sina Fosdick, she made a comment that now George needed that typewriter. I thought that was so cute. <laughs> From Aum, verse 416, it reads, women herself must set an example in unity. By their own hands, women of all races and beliefs will help to mold the step of evolution. There should be no delay. And in closing, ancient legends actually attribute to women the role of the guardian of sacred knowledge. Therefore, may she now also remember her defamed ancestor Eve and again hearken to the voice of her intuition in not only eating of but also planting as many trees, bearing the fruits of the knowledge of good and evil as possible. Let us develop primarily a sense of our own dignity and learn to lean courageously on our own strength and knowledge in order to join in as well as accept responsibility for the great structure of the general good. So let me close with this idea for us to consider on this day, Mother's Day. And this is a quote from letters of Helena Rourke. There exists a most ancient saying where women are revealed and safeguarded prosperity reigns, and gods rejoice. There's so much to think about in dialogue. So maybe you can write a paper about this. Maybe you can set a goal for yourselves, both men and women, of how to bring the beauty of the mother of the world into manifestation in a balanced way, balanced between the two origins, masculine and feminine. So this planet and humanity can survive.